A lot of people wonder how Java got its name. A lot of people think Java is an acronym. Uh, Java is not an acronym. Java's inventor, James Gosling, when he worked at Sun Microsystems, originally called it Oak. However, when the originators of Java decided to go public with it and patent the language, they discovered that there was another language already called Oak. Well, they were all sitting around wondering what they might call this new language, and they were all drinking coffee, and, well, you guessed it, they decided to call it Java. Historically, Java was developed in 1991 by James Gosling and Patrick Naughton. It was intended to be used for interactive television, set-top boxes, and other embedded devices like remote controls and consumer electronics. They continued to develop it and work with it up until 1995, and they began to realize that it was much more robust and much more capable and powerful um, than a language to simply deal with embedded devices. So Sun Microsystems in 1995 decided to go public with a version of Java known as Java 1.0. And they released this along with the Netscape web browser and it became very popular as a web programming language because one of Java's key features is that it is platform independent. In 2006, Sun released Java as uh, open source software. And as such it is protected and it is provided for under the GNU public license. Uh, similar to open source software such as open office and operating systems like Linux. Java and other object oriented languages like C++ are made possible by something known as Moore's Law. Moore's Law was developed by Charles Moore and it briefly states that every 18 months chip speeds will double. The reason for this is that with roughly the same number or the same amount of material you can get twice the transistors on a piece of silicon or wafers of, of negative and positive silicon. In the chip lithography process using enzymes and lasers, they're able to pack things closer and closer together and this makes things faster and cheaper. Faster because the electrons uh, don't have as far to go to jump from one tiny transistor to another. Uh, cheaper because you can pretty much double the capability, processing speed and memory of a device without using really any more hardware. Um, now there is a theoretical limit or a speed bump we will hit in perhaps a decade or two with Moore's Law and that is when we reach a gap where the gap will be so small it can no longer keep an electron from jumping across it. But at least for the temporary or near future Moore's Law will continue. Think back to the way computing was 50 or 60 years ago. Computational devices were large and complicated, and they required large amounts of precious metals and expensive, costly materials. They took up large amounts of space, several buildings sometimes, and consumed large amounts of electricity. They also required teams of hundreds of people to manage and maintain simply just the hardware of the computer. And they were very primitive, with very paltry amounts of memory and, and scant resources. Uh, because of this, languages were linear, and it was much more important to write a simple application that used very little memory and was able to take advantage of very few resources than it was to be able to write large complicated pieces of software. Fast forward to today. Now today we use higher level object oriented languages. Computer hardware is very cheap and inexpensive and people have copious amounts of memory. Because of this it's more important to be able to write large complicated pieces of software uh, that do more and are more powerful and that can be split up among teams of 50 or 100 or even 200 people or even for an individual to be able to produce a more complicated application simply by breaking it up into smaller manageable pieces through the use of functions and classes and other object oriented structures. Let's take a look at Moore's Law uh, at least and how it's had an effect over say the last 150 years. Let's take a look at a timeline depicting Moore's Law. In 1822, Charles Babbage creates the Difference Engine. In 1832, he creates the Analytical Engine. It's considered the first computer that never really worked, and it was mechanical in nature, with nothing that we would consider components of a modern computer. 1843, Ada Lovelace, considered the first programmer, speculates on a computer's ability to emulate human intelligence, if anything can be reduced to a set of algorithms and numbers. Um, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, demonstrates computers can be programmed in 1877. Um, 
Minimax theorem by John Van Neumann used in game programs is developed in 1928. First television is also developed in that time. Um, at this time in 1930, 60% of all houses have a radio. No. Um, incompleteness theorem, electron microscope, Alan Turing, the Turing test for artificial intelligence was developed in 1937. Um, ABC was developed in 1940. Um, during the World War II era, it's the first electronic non-programmable PC. Um, Robinson becomes the first operational computer uh, in 1940, uses electromechanical relays to decode Enigma in World War II. Z3 is the first programmable digital computer in 1941. Then you have Colossus, um, which is more efficient than using mechanical relays, it uses tubes. So it was a thousand times faster than Robinson, but still very primitive by our standards and very costly and expensive. 1944, you had the Mark I. It uses tubes and punch paper for programming. Um, in 1946, they had ENIAC, which was a thousand times faster than Mark I. The first electronic programmable general purpose computer. By 1946, 0.02% of Americans own a television. 1947, the transistor was invented. This was a significant improvement over tubes in the same way tubes were an improvement over mechanical relays. Um, this will make possible miniaturization and solid state electronics. Um, EDSEC, the first stored program computer, where you could actually store a program. Um, George Orwell's 1984, uh, developed in 1949. Um, Alan Turing presents the Turing test in 1950. Color TV's first broadcast also happened in that same year, and black and white TV had its first transatlantic broadcast. EDVAC was the first computer in 1951 to use a stored program concept. UNIVAC, owned by CBS Television, um, predicts election of Eisenhower. 1952, the IBM 701, first computer for mass production. Um, let's go down to 55. William Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory, founded starting Silicon Valley. Um, U.S. develops first design for industry robot in 1955. Um, 1956, the language Fortran is invented. 1956, also Maniac One, the first computer to beat a human at chess. Nothing near comparable to Deep Blue and uh, the Kasparov competition, but still, things are, are developing at an, at an exponential pace. You can see that you know, as we go from you know the late 1800s into the mid 1900s, things are getting faster and faster and faster because of Moore's law. Um, 1958 was the first integrated circuit or IC chip. Um, also, uh, an AI language known as Lisp was created. Um, Seymour Cray builds the first transistor supercomputer in 1958, and a computer beats humans at checkers. Um, COBOL is developed in 1959, a procedural language, and the first Xerox copier, um, the first laser is invented in 1960, 1966, thousand computers are in operation in the U.S., but these are all very expensive computers, um, you know, they're only owned by large government organizations or universities or, or businesses. Na 1956, 72% of homes have television. By 1983, 93% of homes have television. And then as you continue through 1984 and the whole computer revolution with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Apple and Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and Microsoft and IBM and um, you know if you ever watched the movie The Pirates of Silicon Valley, they were at the right place at the right time in history. They were in the crux of all of this effect of Moore's Law and that's how they became what they are today. It, it, it took Moore's law and technology to reach a certain point, a, a critical mass, before it could make a, a computer cheap enough and a computer fast enough and compact enough and simple enough to be a, an average everyday item used in a person's home. Until technology had advanced to that level and Moore's law had brought us to that level of technology, um, you know, people would have laughed at the idea of a personal computer. They would have seen no need for it.